What's going on guys? Do you want to be a better welder starting today? Stick around. Welcome back guys. My name is Brandon and today we're going to be doing some stick welding and I'm going to be answering a lot of questions that you guys have had. I'm going to talk about machine setup, polarity, safety, all kinds of other topics. Let's get going. So one of the first things we're gonna talk about guys is just basic safety. The bare minimum stuff that you should have before you're welding with any process. And here we've got the basic components. You're gonna to wanna to set a nice gloves. Now with stick welding, it's the one process that you really need like a heavier glove. You can't use like a lightweight thin MIG glove or you know even something nylon. You gotta have something a little bit heavier. And I'll share a little secret with you uh, newer guys. You guys experienced welders are going to know this, but you can actually tell by looking at the gloves uh, what hand the person's is their predominant hand. You know, are they left-handed or are they right-handed? So this is the right-hand glove here. This is the left-hand glove. And I can tell by looking at these gloves that the owner of these gloves is right-handed. That's me. Um, if you look in this area here, right here, you see how supple this leather is? Look over here. You see how this is all like crisp and, and burned and it's actually real hard where this is all supple and soft. The reason for that is that my right hand is holding the stinger lead. This, so my hand is gripped around that my left hand is bracing myself. So this part of your hand, your left hand, is where all the heat gets attracted. So just something to think about. So your non-dominant hand, when you stick weld, your glove usually uh, gives out before your other predominant hand glove gives out. Just a little fun fact there. Uh, you're gonna want a good hood. Whatever that is, it, it can be any brand, but the one thing that I notice that a lot of welders avoid, uh, especially new welders, is they don't keep up on their shields. For one, you want to clean it, and you want to clean it using like a microfiber cloth wet with water. Uh, wipe the lens down regularly. Don't let it get all caked up because vision is really important when you're welding. We're going to talk about other little tips that we can do too to help see because that's a big complaint, especially with a lot of newer welders. When these wear out and these need to get replaced, make sure you replace them. A welding cap is great to have. Uh, it works great when you're welding overhead, but not only that, it helps keep metal filings out of your hair, uh, which is also going to prevent eye injuries. And I will share a story uh, that I've shared before with you guys as we go into the video about why I've started wearing a welding cap over the years before I didn't and I got a real bad eye injury. The bill on a welding cap, it's not worn like a regular cap. The bill on a cap is worn on the back. So, and the reason for that is that this shields your neck from welding spatter getting down into it. Definitely want a respirator because you don't want to be breathing a lot of these toxic fumes that comes off the welding process. Make sure you have the proper cartridge for the welding fumes that you're breathing in. These 209 sevens are specifically for welding and metal fabrication. So these are the ones I use. They're low profile and they fit under most all hoods. Definitely want a pair of good safety glasses, something that's comfortable on your face, something that doesn't fog up, uh, and something that is comfortable enough that you will wear them. And then lastly, hearing protection. Now the reason for this is that grinding over time wears down your hearing. Uh, it's hard on your ears, believe it or not. Go a couple hours just wearing these uh, around the house or when you're doing chores and then take them off. You will, you will feel a little stressed out when you take these off. I just feel relaxed when I have these on. And these are great because they're Bluetooth. So I actually have these uh, rigged up into my uh, phone. So as long as my phone is kind of close by with me, I know that if I'm getting a phone call and I can also stream music uh, directly into my headphones, which is great when you're working. Plus, you don't have to listen to grinder noise, which is ridiculous. I'm not really into real loud noise. Make sure you have some sort of protective equipment. Now, this is a leather uh, over jacket, which I wear when I'm stick welding because you want the extra protection for stick welding. Uh, I also have a pair underneath it, which is basically like an apron, and that works also great for stick welding. This is just a simple cotton dickey. 
Uh, you can use that for all. I use this for when I'm welding outside and it's cold. This is a lighter uh, dicky, which this works great. Just a cotton shirt, nothing special. It's not even a welding uh, jacket, but it's just a cotton dicky shirt that works great. Uh, this works good in the summer because they're lightweight. Uh, for the cooler temperatures, I've got a jacket here and I got another jacket. You just want to make sure that none of your sleeves are frayed uh, because it's the frays that catch fire when you're welding. You can see like, see that? There's a little spot of spatter right there. If that was on my arm, that would have burned me. That's what you get when you're welding. You can see more along there. That's pretty typical. Something like this jacket that I'm wearing right now would not be an ideal jacket to wear welding, although I do sometimes, these little frays around my wrist catch fire really easy. And make sure you're wearing a pair of boots. It's no fun having a hot spark drop onto the top of your sneaker and burn down into your foot. Let's cover some processes and terminology. DC electrode positive, DC electrode negative. What is it? When do you use it? Why? And you can see here I've got an AC welder, often referred to as an AC buzz box. When would you want to use that and why? And those are really great questions, but they actually have a simple answer. So let me explain to you in basics of terms. We could go really in depth with this, way in more in depth than I would care to go or even want to know. So I'm just going to explain to you what's what, why you would use it, and when. So I've got my electrode holder here, and I've got my ground or working lead or whatever you want to call it there, grounded off to my table. And if you have a DC welder, you guys have asked me a bunch of times, is it safe to switch it from DC electrode positive to DC electrode negative? Absolutely. If you have connections on the front of your welder that look like this, and they allow you to put these in either of the terminals, you can absolutely swap these around and it causes no damage to your machine whatsoever. Again, this is the electrode holder. So if I were to plug this in to electrode positive, and we're going to explain why we would do it and when. Uh, so you take the electrode holder, plug it into positive right here, so electrode positive terminal, and here would be the negative. So now we just put the ground or working lead into negative. This is what we would refer to as DC electrode positive. We're in the positive terminal. Likewise, if we were electrode negative, this same lead right here would be plugged into the negative terminal. The ground or working lead would be plugged into positive. So why would we do that and when? First and foremost, guys, whatever you select for an electrode or, or a welding rod or rod or whatever you want to call it, just make sure that it's compatible to work on the process that you want to do. If you want to run DC electrode positive, make sure that that rod is capable of doing that. If you want to run it on DC electrode negative or DC EN, make sure that that rod is capable of doing that. So in short, why would we run DC electrode positive versus DC electrode negative? Well, first off, DC electrode positive has really good penetration. It really digs in. It's going to be good for like biting through. You had some rusty material that works really well. It's just going to be good for fitting up heavier plates. It's really crisp. Think aggressive. When you think DC electrode positive, think aggressive. It's going to bond two pieces of metal together very well. Now DC electrode negative, on the other hand, works really well for welding up thinner stuff. It's good for, say, like welding really thin metals down to like sheet metal, has less penetration. So an example of when you might want to run that, so let's say you had a couple pieces of plate, and let's say there was a gap between those two plates that you needed to bridge, it just didn't fit up good. DC electrode positive would have a tendency to blow out, whereas DC electrode negative would have a tendency to fill it in because it's not going to dig into this parent metal as much. DC electrode positive is going to really gouge into this metal. If you have to bridge a gap, DC electrode negative works really well and it also works good as I said on thinner metal. 
So now you're asking, well, I've got an AC welder. Is there an advantage for AC welder over a DC welder and DC electronegative and DC positive? How does an AC welder or a buzz box is what they're often called, how does that fit into this plane? When would I want to use that? So to help explain this, guys, AC is what you have for voltage in your house. So here in the United States, that's what we have for voltage. And this is what the sine wave looks like. AC, alternating current, meaning the current is oscillating. And that current is oscillating up and down 60 times every second. For DC, which is uh, the welder that I've been showing you right now, that's constant current. DC, direct current. It's just a linear straight line. AC fits into this overall scheme. Is It basically fits between DC positive in DC negative. It doesn't do awesome arc starts compared to a DC because you just have a constant current. It's easier to start the arc. It's kind of like I said, the balance between DC positive, DC negative, DC positive, DC negative. It kind of like is that balance in between. Whereas with a DC machine or a direct current machine, you have that ability to just basically swap leads around. DC electrode positive for really thick fit ups, really crisp arc starts, heavy fitment, great penetration, or DC electrode negative when you're working on thinner stuff, you have gaps to bridge, something that's a little more delicate. Root passes often are done with DC electrode negative because you're leaving a gap on a root pass and you don't want to blow through the entire root pass. That's just kind of a quick analogy of when you want to use it. So for that reason, AC welders are fairly inexpensive most people that have been welding for several years probably have one of these, uh, possibly like I have, kicking around in the corner of the workshop. Uh, we've just gone to DC. They're just, those are really cost effective and just all around. They're, they're a great power source. They just, in my opinion, they work better than AC. Now, regardless of your process, whether you make, TIG, stick, whatever you're doing and however you're doing it, you always want to make sure that your metal is clean. You want to get it right down to bright and shiny metal. But there are some rods that will actually work better than others on dirty metal if you can't get it completely clean. And one of those rods being a 6011. Now, I don't want to confuse you too much by getting into too many technical de details here with these numbers, but one thing that I want you to know is that 6011 rod works really good on dirty, metal that you can't get clean it will weld through rust although not ideal it will do it um, it's kind of like a very forgiving rod that will pretty much do everything it doesn't give a great bead appearance but it definitely gives a really strong connection now a 6011 rod is specifically designed to be used in an ac machine like a buzz box they can also be used in a DC machine, which is this. The equivalent to this, which would be the DC only rod, would be a 6010. And you'd run that on a DC machine. So the reason I carry the 6011s is because I can use them with either machine. I can use them with an AC machine or I can use them with a DC machine. One of the disadvantages though of carrying this rod for both machines is that this rod on a DC machine does not run as well as a 6010 rod will run on a DC machine. And I think it's just because a 6010 rod is specifically designed for DC. I carry this, it just saves me from having 6010 and 6011. This one rod works on both, so that's what I carry. And just to give you an idea of some of the things you can do with stick welding is you can weld stainless steel using specialty rods. This is for 3 16 you can weld aluminum, although I've never had great luck. It can be done. Even a really experienced welder uh, that is really good at aluminum. It's difficult, but it can be done with a stick welder. You got the 6011 we talked about, and we got 7018. Now, 7018 rod, you guys probably hear a lot about this rod, and it will really lay down a bead like stacking dimes. The one issue with 7018 is that it really cannot uh, get damp. It can't get moisture trapped in it. It's what's considered a low hydrogen rod. And the problem that happens with 7018 is when you're welding, if you don't have fresh rods, so you can't just, if you're not going to use this up in short order, when you, and you don't have a electrode oven, 
then these are going to conduct moisture. So if you're going to use 7018, you really need to get them fresh, take them out of the package and use them. Because what will happen is, like I said, this is a low hydrogen rod. If, if this rod gets moisture in this outer covering, what will happen is, is that your weld will actually trap hydrogen in it if this has got moisture in it. And then once the part gets stressed, it has a real good likelihood that it's going to crack because of that trapped hydrogen. So 7018s are awesome. Just make sure that you're using them fresh. So don't go buying a whole bunch of it if you think you're not going to use it because it's just going to kind of go to waste. 6011 don't have that problem. You can pretty much uh, dunk these in a tank of water and then set them out, let them dry, they'll be fine. Really good versatile rod, 6011. Although it doesn't give a great bead appearance, it's a very good general all-around rod. Now as far as selecting a welding rod diameter in size, unless you do this all the time, you're going to have to probably look this up. And you probably should. I'm telling you here that if you've got really cruddy dirty metal and you need a real strong uh, connection, then I would go with a 6011 rod. What size do you need? Well, let's figure out. So this is 8 inch material welding. You can pretty much Google anything on the internet and they'll give you a chart. I use Miller Weld's chart a lot because it's a great calculator. We'll pull it up here in a minute, but this is a nice uh, diagram that's kind of like spread out. So this is the column for your electrode size. This is the column for the material thickness that you're using. So if your material thickness is less than 3 16 then you want to use 16th inch electrode. If it's more than 8th inch, you'd use... 8th inch. Let me bring up the Miller Welds chart and I'll show you and that'll give you a lot more parameters. So if you go to that site right there, I think they also have an app too. And it give you all the different processes. Today we're going to be stick welding. So we're going to click on stick welding. Then we'll select the material that we're going to use. So we're going to be doing mild steel. And then we can click on 8th inch 6010, 6011, which is also 3.2 millimeter. So here you can see our amperage range, 75 to 125. It's saying that the 6010 can only be run on DC electrode positive. The 6011 can be run on AC or DC electrode positive. And again, it's saying for DC electrode positive, it has the most weld penetration. When it's on AC, it's a medium weld penetration. Remember I said when you run the raw, uh, run an AC welder, it's kind of like halfway between the two because of the alternating current. DC, you can also run this rod with DC electrode negative, which has the least penetration. It tells about the penetration is deep, and it's an all position rod, flat, horizontal, vertical, overhead. Minimum prep, rough bead, high spatter. So this here gives us pretty much all the parameters we would need to go set up our welder. So for this guys, I'm going to be using my Yes Welder MIG 205DS. This is a multi-process welder. I'll just go over everything with you real quick. Like I said, this is a MIG welder. This will do flux core. This will do solid wire. It holds the big reel and it will hold the small reels. This is a great machine because it's 120 and 240. So if you don't have a 240 volt welder plug in your workshop, you can plug this in to 110, you know, 120 power. I'll show you some of the processes it'll do. I'm, I don't want to get too far into this because this really isn't a welder review. This is a welding video. So but it will do MIG with CO2, it'll do MAG, stick welding, which will be the mode that we're going to be in, it'll do lift TIG, and it will do gasless welding. So let's move on down to the stick welding parameter, which is what we're going to be doing. Now this machine, it's on 220 volt, like I said, it is a multi-process welder and it's dual voltage. It's a 110, 240 volt machine, so I'm on 240 right now. It'll go all the way down to 20 amps. Because this goes all the way down to 20 amps, you can run some of the real small electrodes, which is like 16th inch or I think 1.6 millimeter. And it'll go all the way up to 180 when it's on 240 volt. And with a machine plugged in to 120 or 110 volts, it still goes down to the 20 amps. And maxes out at 146 amps. And you'll see here pretty soon guys when we start welding that 146 amps will definitely get it done. You'll be able to do a lot of stuff on that. You don't necessarily need the full 240 volts. 
you know, you guys could definitely build like, you know, car trailers and trailers. Once you get to that point, you're comfortable. Um, you could build stuff like that easily uh, with these amperages. All right, guys, we're honing in on getting ready to start this process. So we'll get the welder started up and we'll talk about body positioning, comfort. Comfort is the key. If you're comfortable, you're going to weld better. If you're not, you won't weld as good. But because our Miller Welds calculator said we could run this rod between 70 and 130 amps, I'm going to dial this into 70 and we're going to do a little bit of experimenting so that you can see what too low of a setting would mean and too high of a setting would mean. Now that's the range, 70 to 130. So obviously at 70 you'd be on the thinner material of the spectrum and 130 you'd be to the thicker side of that spectrum. I've got my DIY exhaust vent hood uh, all rigged up and that goes all the way over into a booster fan then heads out. If you want to see how I built that I'll put a link up above. Some of you guys like bust my chops because you see the smoke going up and all of it goes right past it. It's because in between takes I have to turn it off so that you guys can hear me because if I didn't you wouldn't be able to hear but I'll show you how I turn on all my stuff I've got a remote here right at my table so one turns on a fan over there that cools me off in the summer two is the booster fan for this and three is an exterior puller fan that helps pull fumes out of the workshop so you can see how loud that is. So between the welder and the two fans running, I can't have it all going all at the same time. So sometimes when you see this, the smoke goes by and you go, yeah, that thing doesn't work for beans. It actually works pretty good when it's on. One of the biggest complaints new welders will have is that they can't see the workpiece. So here is a couple tips. I've already given you one. That was make sure that your uh, lenses are fresh, clean, and if they're all scratched up and they're all coated with char, replace them. The next thing is make sure you got your sensitivity set right. You wouldn't want to go much lower than 10 when you're stick welding. I, obviously the more amperage you use, the more darkness you're going to need, so you're going to need to increase that number. The less amperage, you can go a little bit lighter, but I try not to go below 10, especially with people with light color eyes. You know, people with blue color eyes and green color eyes were more sensitive to uh, arc flash, and that's because you lack a pigment in your eye. It's called melanin. So, you know, people with lighter color eyes versus like people with brown eyes, they have more light sensitivity. It's hard to look at the sun. You get a uh, more severe arc flash. So if you've got light colored eyes, especially, don't go below 10. And then the next little trick is get yourself a work light. Get a nice big bright halogen or something and shine it right on your workpiece. You need to make sure that the light is facing away from you. You can't have it facing you head on because the light facing head on will activate your, your shield if you have an electronic hood. So let me show you how this actually drastically changes uh, the effects on your work. So this is looking through my welding hood. You're looking through the lens as I look through it. This is what I see. The light is off. Now I'm going to turn on my exterior source right here. You ready? Watch this. Look how much better that is. How much brighter you can see your weld puddle. Believe it or not, that makes a huge difference. So if you're having a hard time seeing, experimenting with some artificial light. Bring some artificial light to your workpiece. Shine it on it. It's going to help you tremendously. Make sure your workpiece is really grounded well to the table. That makes a difference. I am not going to put on my welding respirator right now just because I need to be able to talk and you need to be able to hear me. Always take your rod out of the rod holder when you set down your stinger. I call this a stinger. Always never lay them down together. We're on 70 amps. It's probably not going to run too well because it is on 70 amps. So let's give it a whirl. See what we can do. and I didn't have on the fan. So if you guys saw it going by, I totally forgot to turn it on. So you guys heard it extinguish a couple times uh, and that's because it's too low of an amperage. I could tell that it was too low. It actually did a lot better than I thought it was going to, but um, we will give it a try. 
boosting the amperage up a little bit higher and then we'll go all the way to the other extreme we'll go too far but you're holding a tight arc and I also get asked a lot too if you can hold the rod like with your left hand with your free hand to steady it to balance it with gloves on of course my right hand is holding the rod holder with a stinger and I'm using my left hand to help balance or guide the rod like this or like this whatever whatever you need to do to get a steady smooth hand you can yes you can handle the rod you need to have a glove on you need to know that you coming in contact with this rod if you are the path to least resistance which is ground this is trying to find a path to ground then you could get a shock so Nothing is foolproof. You can't never say never. It's very rare that if you're not standing in a puddle of water with your ground lead in the water and your feet are in it that are bare, um, and then you, your hands are wet and you're conducting great electricity, yes, you could get a shock. It's very rare, but it can happen. So I just need you to know that. But, um, it is a common practice for welders to, especially with thinner rods that are like 16th of an inch, they're very springy you can use your free hand to guide that rod so it's not vibrating on the end. It's probably not a good habit to get into. You should probably use this hand and use your other hand to brace to get comfortable. Um, there's all kinds of ways of doing it, but just make sure that you're comfortable doing it. This is personally how I do it. I like to go like this, set this, set this hand on this hand, and use my elbow when I can and that just gives a good brace. You can also do it like this, just a modified version, but you just need to be comfortable. You're holding this rod at about a 15 degree angle, holding a tight gap, and you're just dragging it along. That's it. You never push, always drag. As the saying goes, if there's slag, which there is with this, then you drag. If you're doing like bare wire MIG, then there is no slag. There's no flux core, there's no outer shell or covering. The gas itself is the shielding. This doesn't require gas. The exterior covering on this, the cellulose, is the shielding gas that's shielding this weld from the atmosphere. Bump this up to 90. We're going to start getting real close to the range. You'll probably even hear a difference. There we go. There's 90. I also want to say, guys, that there is no substitute for practice. Uh, with anything, it takes practice. You remember the first time you rode a bicycle. You didn't just go out and rip it and start doing wheelies uh, day one, the minute you put your leg over the bar and sat on the seat. It takes practice, guys. And this is no different than any other skill. The more you do it, the better you get. This is one of the first processes I've learned on. And I firmly believe that it's probably actually one of the cheaper processes you can get into. Um, I firmly believe if you can stick weld and you can do a decent job at stick welding, you can probably do most all the other processes pretty easily. It took a little bit to get it started, guys, because when the rod goes out, it burns back in, and I'll show it to you in a second. I don't know if you can hear me, but sometimes you can see here on the end sometimes the rod will burn back inside that outer cellulose covering and what you need to do sometimes is just tap it on a hard surface to chip back that exterior coating to get that center electrode showing and that's why it had a hard time igniting at the very beginning but that's pretty close that that is really close and how do I know that that's really close um, it might even be a little too hot so look at the very beginning how this bead over here is a little proud obviously it's cold because it's igniting warming up the metal as I travel towards me so now the bead is getting thinner and thinner in height profile and now it's kind of low low and then it trails off to almost a crater at the end and normally you would pause just a little bit to fill that crater but it didn't look um, so that's actually probably maybe a little hot uh, for what we're doing here right now so I would say probably about I don't know maybe 85 86 87 but we'll try it um, 
Let's go up a little bit higher. Let's do 110 and run another one right here. Let's try that. 110 amps. So I'm stopping just to read the puddle a little bit. Yeah, that's real hot. If I went, if I slowed this down even further, I could probably burn a hole through it. See that? I did it. I was just went real, real slow, burned a hole right through it. Let me run this again, guys, so you can see some of the signs without burning through what it looks like. If too hot. Right, we got a couple things going on guys here. Look at the center electrode. You see how the center electrode is actually melted back inside that? Well that's what makes starting the arc difficult if you don't get that flux out of there because it can't, the metal rod, which is where it's making contact all the way through, can't make contact to your workpiece. So give her a tap. Obviously give it a tap when it's not in the rod holder. And now you see how that exposed that back and now you get a nice, good, crisp arc start. But look here, okay? So this area right here is obviously, I blew through, this is too hot. This is 110 amps. So we were at 70, uh, this was 90, this was 110. But then what I did was, is I went right beside it with the same 110, and look how it starts out not very proud, because it's cold, and then it immediately starts going concave in here. This is all concave, this is all undercut. So again, I was traveling really fast, um, and you can see, look at the, the heat affected zone, look at it, how the color radiates out real far from this is compared to say the first one that we did right here has hardly any see how far this radiated out right here I was going slow and that's at 90 amps so I'd probably say right about 85 amps uh, this little telltale concave uh, piece in the end kind of gives away a lot so let me try it again right around let's say maybe 85 amps let's see what that does Let's try that. Much better. Let's go down just a little bit though. Let's try 80. Much better guys. Hardly any little washout at the end. Let me uh, scrape this real quick. So I didn't notice guys, was some of the smoke actually going up into that hood? I hope it was, because I think I had it on for most of the time. And if you can guys, when you're scraping off your slag, and 6011 doesn't have great slag on it anyways, uh, like 7018 will peel, 6011 generally won't. Um, don't like peck at it, try to slide it. Like, it, it, that way it won't gouge your weld all up. All right, guys, so there's some real subtle things going on, but I mean, I don't think you have to be overly educated in welding to know what doesn't look good. So you can see this one is a little too proud, okay, right in here. And then it didn't really terminate off well at the end. That's my problem, and it probably has something to do with the weld metal not being clean. So we were a little too cool here. You can see it started out proud back here. And then it started getting a little too hot, a little too runny, okay? Then we turned it up again, actually blew a hole right through it. Uh, then we turned it up a little bit more and it just continued to get worse, but I traveled faster with this. But you can see there's really no profile whatsoever. It's pretty much completely flat. Then we backed it down a little bit and it started getting better. And it's got a little crevice right here. And then we went here. I started it, stopped it took a look at it, said I liked it. You can see where it terminated here. It did not go below the surface. Then I restarted again, 
and finished out here. I actually ran out of rod towards the end. If you are welding, let's say overhead or vertical, the weld is going to be a little more runnier. So you're going to have to dial back your amperage. You're going to have to use less as opposed to welding on the flat. In welding on the flat, you can weld a little bit harder. So if you're welding overhead, you don't want it super runny because you don't want it coming all down and splattering all over you. Another good thing too, guys, is if you buy, some rods come in like packages, like a cardboard, little cardboard package, and it's hard to seal out atmosphere and moisture. Um, you can pick these up, these rod guards, really cheap, and you, they have a little gasket on them, a little O-ring, and that'll help seal out uh, moisture and hopefully try to make your rods last a little bit longer. Like I say, uh, 6011, 6010s, they're really not that sensitive. You know, 6013 and stuff like that, you can... I try to store them like this. I don't like them in the atmosphere if I can help it. So, unless I'm going to use them up real quick. And that's all there is to it, guys. If you're wondering about the effects of changing DC electrode positive to DC electrode negative, I have a very interesting and popular video I'll attach up above. But like I said, guys, there's really no replacement for just sitting down and getting seat time, striking an arc and doing it. And like I said, I like to go to full swings, go right from the low side to the high side, uh, pad some beads, lay out many, many, many beads. I do that all the time, especially when I get a brand new welder, so I can kind of get that muscle memory ingrained in me of how the machine operates. All machines work a little different, unless it's a calibrated machine and it's a certified machine, which, like, well, I'll show you. So you can see right here, these machines right here, okay? So this actually has a factory calibration uh, tag on it and it passed and it was a precision machine it tells you when it was done 8 7 of 20 and it's valid until January of 22 but because I'm not doing like nuclear stuff or any precision work where I require a fabricated machine uh, a calibrated machine I probably won't get it recalibrated I just don't need that level of detail so all machines are going to be a little hotter, a little cooler. Some are going to run different than others. You know, with a calibration, like the other machine I just showed you, if you pick up that machine and it's calibrated and someone has the same other machine and it's calibrated and you go pick it up, it's going to run exactly the same. It's going to be identical. Once you get to know how it runs, kind of like the video we talked about where we selected the best welding wire out of all of them uh, without a learning curve, you can make pretty much any welding wire run good if you have enough of a learning curve. But I hope some of these tips that I pointed out and some of these tricks, reading the puddle, setting amperage, how to determine it, how to find it, uh, have provided some value to you. And as always guys, there's new videos every Friday, so if this is something that you like, please don't forget to rate comment and subscribe like i said there's new videos every friday if you're wondering what i'm working on before it makes it up to youtube you guys can catch me on facebook and on instagram i'll have links down below if you're wondering about this machine or any others i'll put a link down below there's some exclusive promo codes for some of the stuff that you see me using and especially with this machine you'll get a pile of money off so go check it out click the link or at least learn about it if it's something you're interested in until next week guys i will see you then take care stay safe see ya